let's go ahead and uh, welcome Laurent on. He, he's here. Laurent, if you would like to join us, go ahead and uh, turn the camera on and mic, please. Say hi to all the people. <laughs> hi. Hi, Adam. How's it going? Welcome. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Laurent is from the Azure Red team at Microsoft. This is, I'm, I'm stoked about this talk. <laughs> it's going to be really? great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for I, sure. I appreciate it. I, I think, uh, Dan definitely had like a really good talk about conditional access. It was nice to see that and you know, bringing all that type of ways to get around, particularly like services that rely on, on Azure AD. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's nice to see a lot of that uh, kind of stuff for sure. Definitely. So let me give you a quick introduction. So Laurent, aka Daddy Coco Man, is a 10-year Navy veteran and former NSA operator with several years of offensive security experience, currently works the Azure Red Team at Microsoft loves winning all the CTFs and enjoys writing things in Python and Python-like languages. He's also a dope nerd, nerdcore rapper, oh my, and a member of the Nerdy People of Color Collective, a group that aims to extend representation for minorities and nerdy spaces where they are typically underrepresented. Ron, welcome again, and your, your talk title. Here's some stuff I <laughs> learned uh, enumerating Azure and Azure AD. So without further ado, the Ron Gray. All right, thank you. So that was basically, that whole introduction was basically like my whole who am I slide, but that's all right. So inside of this talk is, here's some swag I learned. I don't know if you thought it was something else, but the asterisk st clearly stand for WAG. And um, it's enumerating Azure, AD, and ARM. So I I've done this talk a few times, but I do want to just talk about some new things that have happened over the last couple of months. And um, so let's get this started. So who am I? Well, <laughs> Bo just gave you all the details, right? I am on the Azure Red Team at Microsoft. I do go by Daddy Coco Man. So you can find my website, daddycocoman.dev, or on my GitHub, where I have a bunch of half-finished projects, just like every other GitHub. I do go by Oh My. Uh, so you can find me at MC Oh My on Twitter. So I'm a nerdcore rapper. There's my website. Uh, you always got to push the SoundCloud, right? Or the Bandcamp. I was in the Navy for 10 years, got out, did all the cool stuff, and I like Python. The agenda for today is talking about uh, Azure Active Directory, Azure Resource Manager, or ARM for short, uh, tools for interacting with AED and ARM, and these are like, more so official tools than like, the, uh, the side projects. And then we'll talk about Storm Spotter. So Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory is the cloud-based identity <laughs> in the access management service, similar to how you have uh, you know, a, a domain active directory, except it's in the cloud. Although, I should also uh, point out the fact that this talk is going to be very uh, basic, right? We're going to talk about the aspects of Azure Active Directory and the aspects of ARM without talking about um, anything like too complex. Uh, so basically, it's, yeah, it's, it's like sort of, it's Active Directory, but it's in Azure. Wow, who would have thought, it, right? The, the name is pretty much clear. And I think that you can take one plus one and, and get two, hopefully in this case. So there's a bunch of AD objects. There's users, which are the, the standard user and member, member identity, like the type, you know, you log in as a user. Uh, you have groups, which is a logical collection of objects, right? So uh, users, groups, service principles, et cetera. You have applications, and applications are used as a template to create one or more service principle objects. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as we go into how applications and service principles are related. Then we have service principles, which is a local representation or an instance of an application within a single tenant. We have devices, which is our, you know, you can have your, your, your phone, you can have your computer. These are managed devices that can be added to Azure Active Directory. And then finally, we have roles, and these roles are permissions for AD objects. So, for example, you would see global or company administrator, depending on how you're interacting with AD. You might see user account administrator, directory members, all these AD roles exist for you to provide permissions to your identities. Let's talk about users, right? They're the standard identity. They can be internal or external. So an internal syntax for a uh, user would be something like alias at tenant.onmicrosoft.com. And an external would be alias underscore their home tenant, Octothorpe, E-X-T, Octothorpe, at tenant.onmicrosoft.com. So for example, I could have Laurent.gray at stormspotter on microsoft.com, or I could have Laurent.gray underscore microsoft.com uh, external 
Stormspotter at Microsoft.com. And you can tell very quickly whether or not someone is native to that AD instance or whether they're uh, a guest user. So each object in the Azure Active Directory or AD has an object ID. And this object ID is how the object is represented, right, within AED and within um, some other aspects of, of services that interact with AED. Then we have groups. So groups are, I mentioned, just logical collections, right? So we have the sales group here, right? They have their object ID. There's five users in it. There's another group inside of that group, no devices. And if you look at the portal, you'll get a very quick overview of what it's in, what's inside a group without having to go through it. So you can get a very quick, quick count of, you know, are there too many members in this group or, or just general membership? So you can have any group, you can have the direct members. So for example, we have Caroline, Catherine, Jason, Kelly, Kyle, and we have another group called sales cashiers within the sales group. And if we were to unroll those members, the, the members of that group, then we can say that, well, we can see that the, the sales cashiers group actually has three other members in it. And when I unroll it, I can see that Johnny Anderson, Kristen Howell, and Dave Frank are also part of the sales group, even though you know they're part of the sales cashier group. So when you have those type of nested groups and nested permissions, it can get kind of confusing if you aren't really keeping track of who has what. Groups can have members or owners who don't have to be members of the group. So in this case, we have the sales group and we have two owners. One is Kelly Santana and we have a service principal that is also an owner for the group. Why? Uh, I don't know, but there is a service principal that is in charge of this group for one reason or another. Next, we have applications in AD. And these applications are templates to create service principles for authentications, or at least that are used as templates. Applications can be either single tenant or multi tenant. So when you develop an application or when you create an application in AD, you have this choice of do you want it to be single tenant, meaning that it's for you only, or do you want it to be multi tenant, which means that it can be added to any other tenant? There is no, there currently is not a way to filter out like specific tenants. So if you are developing an application where you need to have multiple tenants, you sort of have to do it on the code side. I, I know this is being addressed by like the identity team at Microsoft, but you currently have to specify which tenants are on your allow list and inside of your code. And that can be handled pretty easily with uh, authentication libraries. Those multi-tenant apps will be honed in the tenant they were created in, but the service principle will be created in the target tenant. So when you hear things about like malicious applications in Azure, right? It's generally because someone has a tenant somewhere and it, they've made a multi-tenant application and they've convinced your users, maybe they fish them or whatever, to add that application to uh, the target tenant. And that target tenant won't get the application, but it'll get a service principle, which represents the authentication for that application. And the properties are pretty much the same, right? So you have what's called an object ID, which represents that application. But then you also have what's called an application ID, which is the ID of that particular application. So the object ID is for AED to recognize that application, and the application ID is for the service principles to recognize that application. So a service principle is an instance of an AD application somewhere, right? It doesn't have to be in your tenant, it could be somewhere else. Uh, it, you can sort of think of it like a service account, right? Um, you don't have to log in with the service principle, although you can, right? You can add credentials to a service principle, but and it doesn't have to be the case. It's just the authentication for that for that application to act on behalf. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 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 the credential, it's the identity for the application, so that it can act on behalf of whatever the application is doing in your tenant. So you can add a password, or you can use certificates. If you decide to create a service principle directly, um, it'll also create an application inside of your own tenant. So here I made a service principle directly called sales AED SPN. And so it created an application as well called sales AED SPN, which might seem horribly named, but that's, that's, up, to the, <laughs> that's up to the creator. And um, you'll notice that the application ID of the service principle matches the application ID of the application. And so that's how you, you're able to tell which service principles are acting on behalf of what uh, application. Then we have devices. So a device can be AD joined or AD registered, and there's a difference. So a joined AD device is typically a corporate resource, right? So it can be a computer. You know, you can generally computers can be servers, whatever. They're owned by the, the by the company, and they are uh, 
usually part of like a domain or something in most cases. And then you can have a registered device, which is typically bring your own device. So I, for example, I have an Android phone and it is AD registered uh, because Microsoft does not own my phone. I can say I want to access some corporate resources on my phone. And so I have an AD registered device, but then I do have some corporate domain joined PCs or VMs or whatever. And those are joined directly to uh, Azure AD. So these AD roles, um, we can define permissions for other AD objects and built in roles. The ones that you can find in the portal already have a predefined set of permissions. You can add custom roles, but you should probably make sure that it doesn't already exist because making custom roles is really easy to mess up, especially if you don't understand how the, the role actions and not actions works. And we'll talk about that uh, later. All right. So for example, here are some interesting ones, right? Uh, we have the conditional access administrator, right? So if I were targeting uh, someone or a company, I may look for that, right? Someone who has that role um, because then I can modify the conditional accesses. And Indian just talked about that in the last talk. Then we have some other interesting um, services or administrators for services like Dynamics 365 or Exchange. And then we have the, you know, the, the greatest one of all, almost <laughs> global administrator. Right. So there's a bunch of different administrator types that you might be interested in, in trying to access. And if you were to look at the AD roles, you would find a very clear definition of what these roles uh, have. But these roles are, are defined uh, with very specific permissions. Right. So, for example, in this help desk administrator, we can read the description and, and you can see you can change passwords and validate refresh tokens, all the kind of stuff uh, help desk should be able to do. But the way that the permissions are laid out are in a namespace object properties action way. Uh, you can check that website out, you know, directory assign admin roles if you are more interested in, in how these work. But here's some examples. So the help desk administrator, for example, has the ability to invalidate refresh tokens. So within the Microsoft.directory namespace, they have, the, they have permissions over the user objects. And for those users, they can take the action of invalidating all refresh tokens, right? They can also take the action of reading uh, BitLocker recovery keys within AED. And so there's all these other permissions you can get into. There's, there's a lot because there's a lot of namespaces. There's a lot of objects in those namespaces. And once you start trying to get into like custom roles, you just have to make sure that you apply the correct ones. So let's talk about Azure Resource Manager. Azure Resource Manager is the way that Azure handles deployment and managing services. It used to be called Azure Service Manager, but now that's known as Classic, right? So when you talk about like classic resources, we're talking about the old Azure Service Manager. And there's different ways to interact with it, right? You have the portal, right? Which is the normal way you log into portal.azure.com for the public, the main cloud. You can do it through PowerShell, you can do it through the CLI, or you can just you know, throw some uh, REST API requests directly at ARM. And you'll get, you know, basically roughly the same same type of, of uh, interaction with, with Azure Resource Manager. And Azure Resource Manager does do some like a little authentication on the side to see what you have access to in RBAC. We'll talk about that too. But when you interface with Azure Resource Manager, it, it talks to what's called a resource provider. And that resource provider will give you that information depending on what plane you're talking about. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So let's, let's uh this is about the terminology. So we have a tenant, which is a, a, a representation of an organization, right? So Microsoft.com might have a tenant, right? But there might be other tenants under Microsoft but that Microsoft owns that may represent a different organization, right? So I have the Storm Spotter tenant, which and we'll show that a little bit later. But if I wanted, maybe that's like my my uh, my non-production services. Then I might have a you know a Storm Spotter prod tenant that represents the tenant, that represents production services within StormSpotter. So you can have multiple tenants. An organization, a company may have multiple tenants, but the tenant's purpose is to represent a high-level organization. Then we have subscriptions, which is just a log logical collection of resource groups. They're usually separated, separated by billing purposes. So you may have like a HR subscription. You may have an IT subscription. You may have one for every different department depending on how you decide to organize your, your tenant, but uh, they usually separate them for billing purposes. You have resource groups, which are logical collections of resources. 
you have a resource, which is any manageable item in Azure that includes virtual machines, web apps, storage, key vaults. But it's also important to know that the subscriptions, right, which is typically at a seen at a higher level, and the resource groups, which is also seen at a higher level, are actually also considered resources in the terminology. So um, a resource isn't just something that you can interact with and provision, but I guess technically, like subscriptions, you can provision or, or subscription, you can provision a resource group. It's just those are also resources, which is the other. <laughs> then we have resource providers, which I briefly mentioned earlier, which is a service that provides a type of resource. So for example, we have Microsoft.storage for storage accounts, right? That resource provider will give you a storage account when you ask it, I want to create a new storage account. Then we have role-based access controls, or RBAC, which is the set of permissions that a user can take on a resource. The resources are defined by scopes. We'll talk about that too as well but they're not the same as AED roles. So ARM and AED are not the same service. Typically when people talk about Azure, it's very vague and they'll just say, just, you know, everything's in Azure, but you can have AED, right? If you have an Office 365 subscription, you may have AED and not have to worry about ARM at all, right? Or you may not have Office at all. Maybe you do have actual resources like virtual machines. Then you talk about ARM, AD and ARM are not the same. They're, they're very separate. And the way that we interact with, the way that AD will interact with ARM is uh, for authentication is through uh, role-based access controls. So some of these resource providers, right, there's a lot. And there's, there's almost one, for, there is one for every resource. You don't really have to know these. But the one thing to point out is that when you see something like classic, right, so classic compute or classic storage or classic network, that is the old Azure service manager architecture and so you have to interact with those services typically in a different way if you ever look in azure you see like classic administrators those are that's what they're talking about when they talk about referring to the older system so control plane versus data plane um, operations on arm are divided into two categories that's control for management and data the control plane is for managing the resources with arm so when you send that request it's sent to the relevant resource provider. So if I say I want to make a new storage account, it gets sent to the storage account resource provider. And the data plane is for managing the operations of the resource within the resource. So if I want to read a blob in a storage account, right, that's on the data plane. So for here's a quick chart, right? If I want to create a virtual machine, it's the control plane. If I want to RDP to that virtual machine, it's on the data plane, right? If I want to create a storage account, control, right to the storage account data plane, right? It's, I think you can see where that's going. And this is a very important concept for role-based access control because you have to understand the difference between the two planes. So let's talk about RBAC real quick. It is the authorization system that's built on ARM and it helps provide access to Azure resources. It's based on three parts. You have the security principle, which is the AD objects. You can have a user group, service principle, managed identity, but any of those AD objects we talked about before. Then you have the role definition, which is the collection of permissions, right? So you have, a, a lot of these are, you know, a, sh a short name to like, you know, owner or contributor or reader, but underneath those, right, there's a list of permissions for each RBAC role. And then you have the scope, which is the set of resources that the access applies to. So the general RBAC roles you may see are things like contributor, owner, and reader, right? So contributor grants you access, full access to manage all resources, but it doesn't allow you to assign roles in RBAC. But owner will, right? So you have all, you manage all resources and you have the ability to assign roles in RBAC. And then reader, you know, you're just able to read, but you can't make any changes. But then you have like very specific RBAC roles. And these are the type of roles that you probably should invest time in learning if you want to be, if you want to implement like a least privileged model, right? Which you should, right? So for example, if I, if I wanted to give a user only the permission to read things that are on a storage file share, right? Then they can get the storage file data SMB share reader. And that very specific permission says that in this storage account, you can only read things that are in Azure files storage, but you can't do anything else with that storage account. So you have to be very, be as granular as you like, as long as you have a, a wave of ensuring that everyone maintains those specific RBAC roles, whoever's administrating your, your tenant. These role definitions can affect both management and data plans. So we have management, which is actions and not actions. And we have data, which are data actions and not data actions. So what I've highlighted here is that 
for the storage blob data reader, right? I can read the containers, which is a being able to read the containers is considered a management action, but being able to read the blob within the uh, containers is considered a data action. And management access is not inherited to your data. So just because I have permissions to read the storage accounts doesn't mean that I have permissions to read the blob data within the storage accounts. And that's why if you are out here you know, making your custom roles, you have to understand that like, these, these planes are different. So it, it isn't always what you would expect it to be. You just have to make sure that you are implementing these uh, actions, not actions, data actions and not data actions in the right way so that you can make things work smoothly and go about your business. So each action, right, that you can perform on a resource has a permission, similar to how the AD rules, right, had a very specific permission. So for example, if I wanted to copy a blob, right, which is a five down, then for the destination blob, I need to be able to write to it, right? But from the source blob, I need to be able to read to it. And that makes sense, right? I need to read something and I need to write something else. So you have to understand how these how these permissions work and how these operations work on any given resource. And sometimes they can be misleading, right? So for example, here's a storage queue data reader. And it, it, you would think that if you have the ability to read the data storage, right? And you should be able to do certain actions, right? So someone asked me this question. I, I tried to look into it a little bit. I tried to get an answer back to them. So they wanted, they were trying to, uh, I think they were trying to get a message, right? From a queue. But the problem is that the storage queue data reader allows you to read queues, right? It allows you to read the message where you can peek or retrieve, but it requires, in order to do that, it requires the ability to either process an action on that data queue or that storage queue, excuse me, or you need both the delete and read permissions. Now, storage queue data reader only gives you the read permission, but it doesn't give you the delete permission. And that's because the nature of the queue is when you want to get something, you have to be able to read it, but you also have to be able to pop it off the queue, right? So you have to be able to delete that message as well. Data Reader does not allow you to <laughs> delete the message. It only allows you to read it. And we can see that here is that you can only read. What they were looking for was this data, a storage queue data message processor, which allows you to read, but also allows you to process an action. Or they could have had a different role where it allows them to read and delete. So not all of these roles may be as intuitive as you as you may think. So if something doesn't work, you really need to be able to dig down into these actions and figure out what they mean. And luckily, these actions are, are documented. So you can go out and look on docs.microsoft.com and figure out what these actions are doing and, and how they all work and interact. All right, so here's an example of applying RBAC to you know, some objects. So we have these objects called the marketing group or an object called the marketing group, which contains, you know, several other identities. And then the marketing group is assigned contributor access with the scope for the pharma sales resource group. Now, um, one thing with contributor access, they get these permissions to, we talked about manage everything without adding a new, uh, without adding new RBAC roles. So they, now they have full access to all the resources within the resource group, but they can't assign RBAC. So how do we interact with our AD? How do we interact with ARM? couple ways to do it. You have the portal and depending on your portal, or depending on your cloud region, right? There's different websites. The portal is the most common way that you'll see it, right? Just portal.azure.com or whatever your, your, your website is. Then you have the CLI, which is written in Python. You would log in with the AZ login command and your access tokens, whenever you are logging with AZ login are saved in your home directory dot Azure slash access tokens at JSON. Uh, so here's an example of me listing key vaults uh, with the AZ command. Here's an example of me interacting with AD to show a user named Kelly Santana. I should note that if you are logging, if you are using the AZ CLI, because it is written in Python, you are actually installing Python on your system, right? There is within the, I think, program files that Microsoft slash Microsoft SDK or some folder, you, wherever you decide to install it, really, you are installing Python. So if that is a, a concern for you, like your organization and what you are allowed to have, just know that because now if I were an attacker and I see that you have AZ, the Azure CLI on your system, now I have 
I may or may not have access to just use that Python executable directly in order to execute other scripts that are not, you know, that was not intended by whoever installed the Azure CLI. And also the access tokens, if, you know, if, I, if I'm enumerating a user, if I get access to a user's account, I can just grab those tokens and steal their identity, basically. And that's post MFA, right? They've already authenticated. They've already got their access tokens. Access tokens typically only last an hour, but you may also find refresh tokens in there that you can exchange for an access token. Then we have PowerShell. There's a, a bunch of different PowerShell versions. You have AZ PowerShell, which is the newest version for interacting with Azure, which is what you should be using, really. It cannot coexist with the R Azure RM module. Um, I've seen some scripts out there and some tools that are you know, relatively new that you know, say use the Azure RM module. But if you can, like if it's that much of a, of a hassle for you to switch over to AZ for your long scripts or whatever, I guess you can leave it. Just know that you can't use both of them at the same time. And the syntax for this is you would see like verb dash AZ something. So you know, connect that AZ account here. Then you have Azure RM, which is the older version of this, right? Again, it can't coexist with the AZ PowerShell. And that syntax is something like connect Azure RM account. So for the AZ PowerShell, you'll see AZ. For Azure RM, you'll see Azure RM. Then we have the Azure AD PowerShell module, which interacts with Azure Active Directory. Current versions of this will now interact with Microsoft Graph. There is a difference between Azure AD Graph and Microsoft Graph, and that's just simply the endpoint. All right, so Azure AD Graph was graph.windows.net. Microsoft Graph is graph.microsoft.com. And I believe it was a few months ago where Azure AD finally got to the point where it was act interacting with Microsoft Graph. And it also works in PowerShell Core. But previously, before that, there was the MS Online PowerShell module. So if you see that, it means that the script is kind of older. I, I wouldn't say too much older, right? Because this was only really added a couple of months ago, I think sometime in the summer. So uh, you may still see those around if you want to you know, update your scripts or if you're writing a new script, you should use the Azure AD module. It also does not work in PowerShell Core. And then you have the Azure PowerShell module, which sounds like what you want typically, but it's not because Azure PowerShell module it's only used for classic resources. So we talked about the Azure Service Manager before. If you had to interact with some of those classic resources, that's this is the module that you would use. Or if you had some classic management certificates, which is a, a whole different thing. There's a book you can read about using those older certificates from Matt Burrow called Pen Testing Azure Applications from No Start First. So the Azure SDKs are come in a variety of languages. They're broken up into management libraries or client libraries. There's been a lot of refactoring particularly for like the Python ones. So make sure that you test before you try to update your library to a new one. A lot of the changes revolve around how identities are handled underneath at a lower level. So if you are using the SDKs, just make sure that you are using ones that are compatible with each other. Anything that's, I, I want to say, past this spring is, so spring 2020 is, is, are compatible. If you try to use some of the new libraries or some of the older libraries, it may not work. And then you have the REST APIs, or there's a lot of APIs, they're all documented. So just go check that out at docs.microsoft.com. All right, so let's talk about Storm Spotter. So what is Storm Spotter? You can find it on GitHub, first of all, on github.com slash azure.stormspotter. And it creates an attack graph of Azure AD and Azure Resource Manager. And it shows the relationships between AD, the RBAC roles, and ARM. It's built with Neo4j in the background, written in Python, and it has a Vue.js front end. If you are a red teamer, you can you know, visualize your attack surface. If you are a blue teamer, you can do the same thing, just with a different purpose. It's not an official Microsoft product. A lot of people keep calling it like Azure Storm Spotter, but it's not called Azure Storm Spotter. It, I, apparently, there's like a lot of red tape that comes with using Azure in the name of, a, of, a, of anything. So it's just called Storm Spotter. And it is still in beta. Currently, I'm the only person working on it. So forgive me while I'm slow sometimes. So why does it exist? Because you need to understand how the configuration for your resources uh, affects your security for your environment. Relationships are easier to understand when they can be visualized. And you have tools like Bloodhound, right, for displaying relationships in Active Directory. And the tools like Bloodhound have proven to be effective in 
in how uh, how attackers and in helping attackers uh, reach a new level of of proficiency in understanding Active Directory. I do know that they added some Azure modules recently called um, in their 4.0 release. Uh, so that's definitely worth checking out as well. So would you rather look at something like, for example, if I need to get the the service principal owner, uh, uh, the owner of a service principal, I should say, right? I can do it with the AZ CLI, right? And I get this JSON output, or I can look at it, look at it in a graph and say, Kelly Santana owns this application and this application is represented by the service principal. Actually, you know, trying to get this picture on the right, it requires three different queries for Azure CLI. So personally, I would rather just look at the right. There are some requirements for using StormSpotter. You need to have access to AED. So you must have read access to either Azure AD, which is the legacy, it's now considered to be a legacy permission. It's going away, I believe, sometime mid next year. So Azure AD endpoints will be gone. They're trying to move everyone over to Microsoft Graph which is graph.microsoft.com. But for StormSpotter, in the meantime, we do use the Azure AD endpoint primarily because there's a little more information in there that hasn't, at least that I, I don't believe has been fully replicated to Graph yet, but should be by the time that Azure AD is gone. Keep in mind, when I say Azure AD, right, I'm not talking about the, the, the service Azure AD, I'm talking about the endpoint, which represents querying <laughs> Azure AD at graph.windows.net. Right, Azure AD is not going away, but that that particular endpoint is. And then for ARM, you must have reader access at at least the subscription level. And that's because enumeration of resources is generally handled by subscription. And so if, if, whether you're using the, the REST API, the SDKs, whatever, you need a, a subscription. If you try to log in with your identity and you get like, and you have to log in with allow no subscriptions flags that, that exist both in PowerShell and, and the AZ CLI, then StormSpotter won't work for you. And currently, only Azure CLI and Service Principal logins are supported. So there will be more in the future. I just got to get around to, to adding those. So there will be a demo. So we're going to say that we found credits for a user named Kelly Santana. Maybe we found it in a Git repo in an old commit or something, right? Because that's where creds like to be. Kelly has access to read AD and some Azure resources. And we're going to see if we can find a path for a lateral movement using StormSpotter. So if you remember earlier, Kelly Santana was in sales. She happens to be the sales manager, right? So from that perspective, right, we, we know what, we can get a, an idea of what she shouldn't have access to. And we're going to see what she actually does with StormSpotter. All right, so I've actually already logged in with Kelly's account. Live demos, these always go well, right? And if I show the account, I can see that I've logged in as Kelly Santana right, at StormSpotter. So I am going to go to the right folder because I am not there already. Right. And if you if you look at the uh, the GitHub, you can there's different ways to to use the, the tools. I've compiled Python zip files so that they're easily distributable and reproducible. And if I want to just run it. I just call Python, the SS collector.pyz. And I'm going to, since I've already logged in with Kelly as a CLI, I'm just going to use the CLI argument to start my enumeration. So a couple of things happen, right? I've authenticated with the CLI credentials. It works great. I'm starting my enumeration for ARM. I'm starting my enumeration for Azure AD. And I'm going down the list. So I'm, I'm, I'm querying users, service principles, applications, roles, AED groups at the same time. These are all happening asynchronously. The one thing to note is that with graph, you sort of have to, you have to go like one object at a time, right? So, or a couple of objects at a time, you can't sort of, you can skip, but you can't really skip. But by that, I mean, so if I'm querying users, right? And I want to get to the next user object, I have to go one by one. So all this is done asynchronously as far as the AD objects, but within each AD object, you sort of just have to go in a row. So if you have a large organization, for example, maybe, I don't know, roughly 300,000 service principles, you have to sort of just go through those service principles one by one, and it may take a while in order for you to get those requests completely finished. So I've already started enumerating my resources. I try to enumerate management certs, but management certs are a classic thing, and I don't have any classic management certs in my, in my tenant. So this forbidden sign, right, it's, it's actually a good thing 
Um, if you don't see this forbidden sign or, and you're able to enumerate management certs, if you don't see it, then that's probably something you should look into if you are querying either as an attacker or a defender. Then we get our RBAC permissions, we finish querying, and we have a couple of things here. This are uh, These, rather, are things that Kelly can see but can't enumerate. These are actually some of the security implementations I have in place specifically for this demo, and you'll see why in a second. But Kelly like knows that they're there, but can't actually do anything with it. So it's just sort of a warning saying, hey, this exists, but it's not going to be ingested. Then I finish querying, and then I get a results output in, in a zip folder. And the zip folder is a bunch of, by default, it's a bunch of SQLite files. There was a requirement from someone at work, they needed JSON. And so I, I implemented like a JSON switch, and you can do it that way too, if you want to use that same data to use some other tool, but I just use SQLite. And then I'm going to start up StormSpotter with Docker. And it's fairly quick. I start up Neo4j, start up the back end, start up the front end. And it starts on port 9091. And here we go. All right, so this is the login page. All right, I'm going to log in. The default password is password, actually. Maybe it hasn't finished. Okay, now it's finished. The default password is password, and I'm going to log in, and it's going to be, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to zoom in a bit, and we get our, our interface here. So I'm going to upload some results, the results that I've, I just collected with StormSpotter. It's going to upload. I currently don't have the implementation to show you on the front end that the ingestion has finished. So that will be coming like next month. So for now, you can just sort of look at the, uh, the logs and it'll tell you when it finishes processing the entire zip file. It really shouldn't take too long. I don't think, there we go. Completed ingestion. All right, and now I can do all my queries. So the first thing I wanna know is if I'm trying to escalate my privileges, right? Who are the global administrators? And so I have some preset queries here where you can just sort of copy and paste into this text field. <laughs> And I can see that I have a couple of global administrators. It's listed as company administrator because depending on how you interact with AD, it'll either be company or global. Those are the exact same roles. They just have different names. It has, it, when they change it to global administrator in the portal, because you know some older scripts and tools were still using company administrator, they didn't change that from the API standpoint, but it's the same difference. So we'll, we'll consider this global administrator. So if I say global, company, whatever, same thing. And we have a couple here. So we're gonna ignore Craig, real quick, we're going to ignore myself, and that is just because of the way this tenant is set up. And we have two interesting global administrators, right? So if I click on one, I get information about them. So we have this administrator named Global, and then we have this other administrator named Chalk Olate. And we eventually want to get to them, right? Because those are the, seem to be the two most you know, powerful people in this tenant. So starting from where I am, I need to know, I've logged in as, as Kelly. And so I need to figure out what accesses I have as Kelly. So we just do our, our normal Cypher query and I get this Kelly object here. And I can look at information about Kelly. For the sake of time, I'm gonna just sort of just go through this. So if I right click, I can do something like expand outgoing. So what relation, what does Kelly have a relationship to? And I see a couple of things, right? So Kelly owns sales, right? Kelly is the sales manager. And the Kelly also owns the sales cashiers group, right? And as well as the service principal, uh, as well as the, the application and the service principal that we saw earlier. But interestingly, Kelly is also a contributor to the Storm Spotter subscription, which seems like a lot, right? Kelly doesn't need to be, or you know, doesn't, and this is sales department doesn't need to have contributor access to the entire subscription. So let's see what's in this subscription. We're going to expand outgoing. And we have a bunch of different resource groups here, right? And we have all these resource groups that Kelly has contributor access. Remember, contributor is I can manage all these resources, but I just can't change our back. So we have these IT department, right? What's in here, right? Oh, there's a key vault in here. Maybe I can go enumerate that key vault. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to get straight to where the, the juicy stuff is. And, and that is Glow, right? So we have this Glow resource group, and we remember that we have a, a global administrator named Glow Bull, 
right? So let's see, let's see what's in this uh, this resource group. So under the Storm Spotter subscription, I have this Glow resource group, and it has. I'm going to change the graph layout just to make this things easier, right? So we have we have a key vault. We have there's lots of creds key vault. We have a couple of we have a, we have a virtual machine, right? We have a disk, and basically this is saying that Kelly, who is contributor to this subscription, now has the ability to manage all of Glow's resources, which is a problem, right? That's not something that you would want a random person who is not in the global, <laughs> not related to the global administrator to have. So if we look at this VM, and a lot of things are going to shift on the screen right now, simply because of how things are related. When you, for example, if you, if you were to provision a virtual machine, you get an IP address. That IP address is technically under the, it is a resource that is under the resource group, even though it may be attached to the VM. So when you here is an IP, for example, right? There's an IP, but if I were to start expanding this virtual machine, eventually I'll get to the point where the IP is sort of just attached to the, the virtual machine itself and not just like sitting over here. It's a lot of expansion. There we go. All right, so here's this virtual machine, which is connected to this virtual network. If, if you were using Storm Spotter and you see this X, it just means that the image hasn't been added to the front end. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just a, I don't have an image for it yet. So I just, I put an X as opposed to a question mark where I don't know what it is completely. So anyway, so I have this IP. And then I can also see that it has a network security group, which allows me to RDP into this, this uh, virtual machine. And then I also have this JIT rule or just in time where I need to be of, you know, I can, for the demo purposes, I want to make sure that no one else is logging into this VM that I have open right, or exposed to the internet, technically. Um, and so I put a JIT rule that says, if I want to connect to this IP, then I have to go tell the security center that my IP is XXXX and please give me access to this virtual machine, which you should do when you have like a, very sensitive resources, you should probably implement some level of JIT so that not everyone can access uh, a resource or you can sort of log when people do access your resources. So back to the, the topic at hand is that, so now as Kelly, I have contributor over this resource group, which means that I have contributor access inherited over this virtual machine, which means I can do something like reset global's virtual machine administrator password, right? And I can gain access to that. So let's do that real quick. I can show you what that looks like, right? So I'm saying, here's this VM name, I like being admin, part of the resource group Glow. And I'm gonna make a user named temp admin. And I'm going to add this password. So again, I added JIT so I can just show you what it's like so that nobody else, because I basically just gave you an IP address, a username and a password. Once this finishes, then I could then log into the IP address with temp admin and we'll just see what's in there real quick. Copy this. All right, so it finished. It was a success. I've changed. I've just changed Glow's virtual machine password as a member of the sales department. And I'm going to connect. It showed up on the wrong monitor. So let's bring this over here. Bam. And now I'm in this, this other VM you know, in, that's not mine, right? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and see what I can access, right? I'm now an administrator, so I can do things like persistence in this VM or whatever you would do as a red teamer, right? Or a pen tester. And I've already accessed this, but in, if I were to look inside of the users folders for Glow, I can see that they've logged in with the Azure CLI because they have the .Azure folder. And I have some access tokens. Now the access token has been long expired, right? But inside of this, inside of this is a refresh token that I can use to get a new access token and claim that identity. So from this point, it's just a matter of copying this folder to my folder. Which I'm actually already done. And replace those files. And then if I were to start in 
terminal. Sorry, it's super small, but um, if I just do AZ account show, it's going to grab those other access tokens, which weren't mine originally, and then show that I am now global ADM. And then I can go, I've just as, uh, elevated my privileges from a normal, what should have been a normal user to global admin. I'm gonna close that. Let me get back to these slides. Things to consider that these compl these permissions can be complex. So if you are implementing them, make sure that you do it the right way. It, it, it just make sure you read the documentation as much as possible and you implement them in the way that is best suited for your tenancy. You should regularly audit your permissions to check for changes as well as log permissions changes, which you can do. It's a little complex, but it, it's it's there. The ability to audit these permissions is there somewhere. Follow the least privilege rule. So you don't need access to an entire subscription or resource group to access a resource as a user, right? You can just give a user permission to access that resource within a subscription and not give them permissions over subscription. So enumeration tools like StormSpotter can't be used. And if you have any questions, I'll be, uh, well, that's the wrong, that's embarrassing. So that's the wrong con. If you add me on LinkedIn, put in a, a food and wildlife hacking fest. Uh, there's my LinkedIn, uh, there's my email and my social media. And thanks for having me. That is all I have. Awesome job, Laurent. Everyone give him a round of applause, digital round of applause. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, thanks so much for doing the talk. Storm Starter looks amazing. Like it just looks so good. Like the the, the GUI just looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, that graph that. that graph looks awesome. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm just you know just kind of trying to rip off Bloodhound. You know, don't tell them. I know they're here. So, yeah. <laughs> it looks cool though, man. I mean, it looks sweet, especially all black. You know. It's, yeah, it's a uh, it it's a I've I've learned a lot about front end work this year over the summer. Oh, I've, I've never been much for graphic design or anything like that, but it was it's an experience and. uh Hopefully it just gets better. It's you know, open source. People can add, add their pull requests, you know? Yep, definitely. <laughs> people help out. You hear that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Then pull request in. I think we've got Chris Truncer here. I see him in the, the list. Chris, what are you doing, What's man? Up, Chris? Hey, man, how's it going? I'm just chiming in. I have, had to watch that presentation. That was pretty awesome. I oh. have actually yet to play with uh, that, so I am going to definitely be doing so soon. See the slide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there he is. let me know. Give me any feedback. Hey. Yeah, yeah, I loved it, man. That, that was really cool work. I like seeing that. I got to play with that a lot more now, so I'm excited. So, Laurent, I actually had a question for you. One of the things that I I noticed. So, so looking at the access tokens that are in the uh, .az folder or the .azure folder that show up in mm -hmm. the AZ CLI. So, one of the things I noticed is with the PowerShell PowerShell AZ module. So. Previously, I guess like even just like a couple months ago, if you logged in with the AZ PowerShell module, it would create the token cache that file sure. in yep. that same file. But that changed like last month. <laughs> so I was so I have a lab, I have a lab in my class where we go and pull that out and we, you know, use it, reuse it to, to log in. And I was demoing the lab and it just didn't work because it wasn't there anymore. And so we had to like look around for it, and it turned out it's in um, it's in app data now. It's uh, it's an msal.cache file, protected by DPAPI, I guess. Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. That's something I have to look. I, I typically don't use the PowerShell modules. So. No, I was just wondering if like maybe but, uh, if you'd seen something similar with the AZ CLI or not. I know that. I mean, you just showed it, so I guess like it's still the same there, right? Like where it's in the .azure folder. Yeah, and, and you know there were talks of of trying to not make it as easily accessible or in plain text right mm -hmm. uh so if they're if they are using the poppy which happens to be my uh, spanish stripper name um <laughs> then, then yeah for sure i mean that's the right uh, way to pronounce it right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't know that there was any other way <laughs> yeah. yeah that's the way i pronounce it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for sure uh I, i'll look into that and i'll I'll post about it on Twitter if I find out something has changed. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. 